Hello, new or potential new Darktable user. My name is Bruce Williams, and this is Understanding Darktable. I previously did a newbie's introduction to Darktable. It was episode 69, and if you haven't already seen that, it's probably worth watching. But the reason I'm updating that video is because with the release of version 3.4 on Christmas Day of 2020, quite a few things changed. And I didn't want people to watch that video, but run version 3.4 and suddenly go, hang on, this is not the same. So that's why we're doing this. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 84 of Understanding Darktable. Like I said, episode 69 covers a lot of the same ground that we're going to cover today. So it's definitely worth watching that if you are new to Darktable. It'll give you at least a basic idea of the workflow, most of which I will cover again, but I'll probably cover it differently. And there'll probably be stuff I'll cover today that I didn't cover in Ep69. And there'll be stuff that I covered in Ep69 that I don't cover today. Before we get started, a couple of things. This little thing up here is not part of Darktable, so don't stress if you don't see that on your copy of Darktable because it's actually a separate app. It's called Keymon, and what it does is show mouse clicks, mouse wheel operations, and if I type anything on the keyboard, that will show up here as well. I run that so that if I forget to mention what a keyboard shortcut is, then you'll actually see it up there as I'm working my way through the video. All right, so where does one start with Darktable? Well, first up, you're gonna to wanna to get some images into Darktable. I have attached to my computer via a USB port and a card reader, a memory card with some still images on it. If I want to select or import one or a handful of images, I would use the import image button. And as we can see from the path, this is a, an external disk. There's a DCIM folder. And within that, there is another folder. And then all of my raw and JPEG images appear here. And like any operating system, you can sort by name, sort by size, sort by the time it was modified, which is what I've got chosen. And I've got a bunch of images here that I shot half an hour ago. And they're just some random images shot here in my studio. I'm going to import those images just by shift clicking all of them. As you can see, there is an option to apply metadata on import. Use that as you see fit and click open. And Darktable will create references to where those images live. So the images are not copied anywhere. They are simply imported at their current location. Now, because that's a memory card, that's not particularly helpful. I really need those images copied to a folder on a hard drive on my system because the moment I remove that memory card to go out shooting, those images are no longer going to be available to Darktable. For that reason, I prefer to use a third-party app and on Linux, it's a thing called Rapid Photo Downloader. I've spoken about it before. If you're on Mac or Windows, you will probably find some other application that works for you, or you may be happy with doing it the way Darktable wants you to do it. Just before we move on, let's look at the folder option. As you will see, all of these image files cannot be selected because we've said to Darktable we want to import a folder, not an image or a bunch of images. So in order to do that, we have to actually select a folder. And then we can click on open and Darktable would import every image file that it finds in that folder. If there are subfolders inside this folder and those subfolders contain images and you want those images imported as well, make sure this box is checked. Import folders recursively. That basically says scan any subfolders. If you have your camera, like mine, set to shoot RAW plus JPEG, but you don't want to import the JPEGs, you just want the RAW files, make sure ignore JPEG files is also checked. Okay, I don't want to do that. The other option is mass storage camera. 
And this will only appear if your system detects that a memory card has been attached or your camera has been attached to your computer. How this looks on Mac and Windows, I can't rightly say because I only run Darktable on Linux, but it does bring up a slightly different dialog box. And by default, it's going to view every single image that is currently on your memory card. And as you can see, it's going to take it a while to scan all of those images. So for me, this is not the most efficient way of importing your images because I'm still waiting to find the images, there we go, finally, that I shot half an hour ago. So again, entirely up to you which way you want to work, but that's how to import images into Darktable. Now that I've got images into Darktable, I might think, well, now I want to start working with them. What am I going to do? The first thing I want to do personally is get rid of all those JPEGs because I don't want those. To do that, I would go to the Collect Images module. This is a fantastically powerful module. You'll notice that there are two drop-down arrows, one to the left of the text field and one to the right of the text field. By default, Darktable will always show you a film role. Now, in Darktable parlance, what a film role represents is an import procedure. It's any time you imported a batch of images. So that means that a film roll might actually contain images from multiple days. Okay, if you came home from, let's say you went away for a weekend and you shot Friday night, you shot Saturday, you shot Sunday, and you've arrived home Sunday night and you've imported all your images, they're going to appear as one film roll, but they cover Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, on this second drop-down arrow, we have clear this rule, narrow down search, add more images, exclude images. So, I want to narrow down the current search because the current search is the film roll of images I just imported. So, now I want to narrow that search down. That gives me a second field through which I can refine my collection of images. So what I would do is rather than go with tag, I will go with file name. And then I would put in .jpg, hit enter. Now I'm only looking at the JPEGs. I can select all of those images. And if we wait for that little tooltip to pop up, remove from the collection and in brackets it says delete. I just want to make clear, it will not delete the images from the folder in which they live. It will simply delete them from Darktable. Okay. If you want to delete the images from the folder in which they live, you would use the trash button and that will actually remove them completely from your system or in this case, memory card. So I can click on remove. Yes, I do want to get rid of them and now they're gone. Now, if I want to get back to the raw files that I imported, I can go to the recently used collections and I can go back to Filmroll 100MSDCF because that's the folder from which those images were imported. And now all that's left is just the raw files. How do I know they're just the raw files? Well, I can mouse over them and see that they have an extension of .arw. I can also click on the little star button up here in the top right hand corner and I can choose what kind of overlay I get as I mouse around inside this middle area of the interface. No overlays, pretty self-explanatory. Overlays on mouse hover means as you mouse over, you will get that pop-up tooltip, but when you're not over an image, you don't see it. You can also choose any of these other settings. I'll let you work them out for yourself. Just going back to the collect images module, once you have defined a collection, you can click on the hamburger icon here, presets, and down the bottom, store new preset. And you can use any combination of all of these types of fields to generate a collection of images that you might want to come back to at some later point. As you saw from my selection, I have all the different holidays that we've taken over the years 
saved as collections. So if I ever want to get back to a particular group of images from a holiday, I can just click on that selection and all of my images from that particular holiday are retrieved. But we can use multiple fields to create a collection. Let's suppose, for example, I'll hit reset parameters and that will take me back to my entire library of images. Let's suppose I wanted images of me. So I would go tag and I would search me. I've got 991 images of me, apparently. And let's say I want only images which were shot in 2012, let's say. So I would go date taken and I would type in 2012. There's all the images in which I appear that were shot in 2012. Next, I might say, I only want images that were shot in South Australia. So I would go South, oh, I'm looking at film roll. That's no use to me. Let's go tag and South Australia. There are seven images and I could then save that as a preset if I needed to. All right, that's enough for the collect images module. We also have the image information panel. This is fantastic. This will tell you everything you need to know about any image you mouse over, including where it lives, aperture and exposure information, focal length, ISO, the date it was shot, how large the image is, pretty much everything. It's a very handy module. The recently used collections module will just keep a running tally of the last, what is that, 10? collections that you've used. So as I added more filters, each of those became a different collection and they basically are most recent at the top and oldest at the bottom. Next up, we've got the selected images module and there is a whole bunch of different things you can do with the images that you've currently got selected in the main part of the interface. Then we've got the history stack. This is where you can copy parts of your processing history in order to paste them into other images. So if you've processed one image in a particular style and you think I have this other bunch of images and I want them to have the same processing, you can copy the parts from a selected image and then paste those history items into the other images that you want. You can also compress history, discard the history if you want to just reset an image back to the way it was at import. You also have the opportunity when you do any of those aforementioned things to either append the history to whatever history already exists for an item or to overwrite that history, thereby resetting the image first and then pasting in whatever history items you've copied from another image. The styles module will allow you to select a bunch of history states from an image that you've already processed and save all of those things as a style. So if that's something that you know you're going to want to use on a regular basis, you can save it as a style and then apply a style to a single image or a bunch of images. You'll notice that I have Instagram frame. I've spoken about this before. When I post to Instagram, I use a square white frame. It looks like this image here so that I don't have to conform to Instagram's format or aspect ratio restrictions. If I want to post a three to one panorama by putting it in a square frame, I can get a three to one panorama onto Instagram. Now, of course, it's still not going to display at full height. It'll only display at full width, but I do like that particular idea. There's a bunch of different ways that you can use styles. And as you can see, you can create, edit, import, export, do whatever. Next up, the metadata editor. This will allow you to modify any of that metadata that you may or may not have chosen to apply at the import images stage. You've then got the tagging module. This will allow you to create or modify, add, remove any tags to an image or a bunch of images. So if you have just got home from a weekend away and you've imported a bunch of images, you might say, well, these were all shot in a certain location. So you can add that location and apply it to the whole batch of images. 
This does allow for nested keywords. So you'll notice that when I type Australia, I have things that include the country, then the pipe. The pipe is uh, what you find when you go shift backslash, or at least that's how it is on my keyboard. I'm hoping that's consistent around the world. The pipe icon acts as a delimiter. So I have the country, the state, and then the region in which those images were shot. How you choose to use this is entirely up to you. Uh, and again, I've done individual videos on pretty much all of these modules. So if you want a deeper dive, go and check those out. Geotagging will allow you to create time offsets. Uh, this is really handy if you've shot with multiple cameras and the cameras didn't have the same time setting uh, within their own, you know, camera bodies, uh, you can then create an offset that will allow for the different time settings in multiple cameras so that when you look at your images collectively, they appear in chronological order. You then have the export selected module. This is where you can select again, an image or a bunch of images to export from Darktable as JPEGs, TIFFs, PNGs, whatever export format you want to use and wherever you want to send them. And there's a whole bunch of different options here as well. Oh, almost forgot to mention, down the bottom here, we have a, another pop-up menu with three items, the zoomable light table, the file manager, and culling mode. Now, I usually run in file manager mode, and that allows me to choose the number of thumbnails displayed per row. So you can drag this back to the left to make your thumbnails bigger, drag it all the way to the right to get up to 25 thumbnails per row. And you can choose what is the most responsive according to your system. The zoomable light table, as the name suggests, can be zoomed with your mouse. You use the mouse wheel to zoom out and you can then left click and drag to drag the light table around and wherever you point your mouse when you zoom in that is where you will zoom in to so it's a very handy function next up is the culling mode and i'm just going to look for some images maybe something like these two images here I will then go into the culling mode and what that will do is activate the film strip at the bottom, which you can toggle on and off with control F. That would be command F on the Mac. It defaults to however many images you have selected in the film strip, or if you haven't made a selection, it will default to two. But again, you've got this slider. You can just look at one image at a time, or you can look at a whole bunch of images so that you can choose, oh yeah, this one's better than that one or whatever. You can use numbers to apply star ratings or you can use the F1 to F5 keyboard shortcuts to apply color ratings in the order of F1 for red, F2 for yellow, F3 for green, etc, etc. Okay, I think that does it for the view of the light table. So I am going to wrap up this video here and in the next episode, we will look at processing your images in the darkroom view. Just a reminder before I go, episode 69, a newbie's introduction to Darktable. Once again, if you haven't seen it, after you've seen this one and the next one, it might be worth revisiting 69 just to see if I covered some stuff slightly differently or if I've covered some stuff in that episode that I've not covered in this episode and episode 85 or vice versa. Alrighty, I will catch you in the next one.